Welcome to another episode of the Street Photography Show podcast. Tonight, I will be speaking with Steve Hooker, a talented photographer based out of the UK. Welcome to the show, Steve Hooker. How are you, sir? I'm very good, thank you. Yourself? Excellent. Thank you for joining me on the Street Photography Show podcast. Hey, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So, Steve, how did you get into photography? And specifically, how did you get into street photography? Well, it's a difficult one to answer because I always think that I started street photography, A, when I got my first digital uh, uh, camera, which was a Nikon. But looking back over my film photography, because I started back in the days of film, and I convinced my father that he should really get a, a camera from me on that kind of high purchase. You have to like pay so much a month. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and I convinced him enough for him to do that. But I've never liked uh, formal photographs. I don't like posed shots. I kind of like candid stuff, but I also like people going about their everyday lives and business. And if I look back at my photography, I realized I really started getting into street photography in about the late 80s. Um, and then it was just film back then. It's now become something of an obsession, um, to be honest with you, because I like um, I do it every day. All right, I lied. I haven't done any today, which is very unusual. But I've, that's because I've forced myself to leave my camera at home. And there's a good reason for that, because I just end up doing a lot if I don't. And plus, you had to come on the show. <laughs> there, 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 is, there is that as well. I mean, my backlog of, of street photography goes back to July of last year. Uh, and that doesn't include uh, all. I, I went to New York uh, to see a friend uh, for six days last month. I'm going to Morocco next week. I go out at the weekends with friends. I've got mountains and mountains of photographs to go through. And I've got to wean myself off of. Because I like to carry a camera around with me all the time. Not just my mobile phone, which is also very good. But... I've been a street photographer for a long time, and yeah, it, it, it is an obsession. I will, I will own up to that. That's fantastic. I mean, a lot of what you were saying there was resonating with me. I as well started a long time ago, and I as well was, you know, a film boy. I started with film. I, I learned photography with film. I carry a camera with me every day, but don't shoot every day. I will be honest. It's, uh, it's very difficult with my schedule. But I do have a camera with me and I do that because if I do see a moment that I want to capture, I take it out and I, I shoot. And sometimes, you know, I'll carry a little point and shoot camera that I have or I'll carry a little digital camera or even my phone. As you said, phones, I mean, they are quite good, especially some of the, you know, the newer and the higher end models like the iPhones and even the Google Pixels are pretty good. Yeah, I, I use a, I use Google Pixel uh, six. Um, I keep looking at the seven and the eight, but uh, a it's a lot of money, and b the camera works just um, j just fine. The cameras I tend to carry around, although I've just recently sold it, was the, the Ricoh GR three X, uh, and and these are the cult street cameras. But unfortunately, I, I couldn't get on with it. The GR two I loved, but it mine mine broke. A uh, very sad day. I nearly cried. I did cry. Um, <laughs> I would do. And every so often I go back, obviously, because I'm, you know, picking, going through photographs from last year. And I, I see a lot of GR2. I've actually been posting a lot of GR2 photographs. And I'm looking at them going, oh, my God, why haven't I still got that camera? But like you, a point and shoot is brilliant. I tend not to carry around big cameras. Like I don't like Canons. I don't like Nikons. I like Fujifilm uh, DSLRs. The, the thing with me is to always carry a camera um, uh, around. I think that's kind of important. What gear are you using on an ongoing basis? On an ongoing basis, I have started to fall in love with Panasonic. Now, that is unusual because I have I had a Panasonic DSLR on loan a couple of years ago, and it was horrible. It was the latest one, a GS or something. I can't remember. It was just soulless. But they're, they're smaller cameras. The Luminix, what have I got? I've got a TZ100, which is like a little compact camera. And I took that to New York with me. And when I came back, I went through all my photographs. I'm photographing from the Empire State Building. I'm photographing on the street. I took my GR3X with me. And I used my GR3X on one day and the Panasonic every other day. Because it's one of those like travel cameras, so it's got a zoom. I don't use a zoom that often. But I got such high contrast photographs. Because the thing that attracts me as well about street photography is not just the people. It's the light. I'm, I'm a great chaser of, of light. You've looked at my photographs, you know that high contrast, shadow, light. I chase that like there's no tomorrow. And I didn't think this camera would work very well, but it, it produced for me photographs that I'm happy with in New York. So I use that. I use the Fujifilm X100. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes. Another rangefinder kind of camera. But the camera I picked up finally, and I'm picking it up now and holding it in my hand because it's so comfortable, is the Luminex, another Panasonic GX9. 
and it, it it has the viewfinder that flips up so you can look down rather than holding it up to your eye you're looking down and I, I've tried this with people when I've been out and they don't, don't really notice you that much it's very kind of Vivian Mailer Myler I never know how to pronounce her name Vivian Meyer Meyer thank you she was using a Roliflex twin twin reflex camera that she's looking down into and it, it distances you from your audience a bit you don't have that eye to eye contact that was one of the reasons I was attracted um, to it. And again, she's kind of one of, one of my influences. But this is the gear I'm going for. I've, I've got to carry a lighter camera around with me. I've got to fit in my pocket. It can't draw too much attention. It can't make a lot of noise. I went through a similar revelation probably about almost a decade ago. Not quite, but near. I found a camera that I completely love. And ironically enough, it is a Micro Four Thirds. It isn't a Panasonic. Panasonic was on the list and probably would be the <laughs> next time. However, I have been using predominantly the OMD EM10 Mark I. I bought one not knowing what I was not knowing what to expect. I used it. I completely fell in love with the image quality that I was getting out of those prime lenses because I was also yeah. using the matching Olympus lenses. Oh, that's gorgeous. I dumped all kinds of money into the entire system. But then I realized about maybe three years ago that I really only use the Olympus for street photography. So things like the extra gear that I had bought, like the zoom lenses and all that, I sold it all. And I only kept the two bodies. I have 25 mil, which is 50 millimeter focal length. And I have the pancake lens, which is considered a quasi kit lens. It, it performs phenomenally well. I, I mean, the images I get out of that lens are actually mind boggling for you know what it is. Well, you know, you know, it's funny you should say this because I've been exactly where you've been. I used the the Olympus OMD. I started with a a, a, a five a EM five, the very first one. I then got an, a, a a ten. I got a two and a three. I gave one to my son, and then I got an EM five Mark II. And I love those cameras, and I love those lenses. And to this day, I'm not really sure why I, I gave them up. I mean, the quality what you're talking about there of the images and the lightness and the ability to almost put it in your pocket it, it, it appealed to me. The thing that I like about it so much is that okay the images are very as i mentioned the images are sharp the focus is very quick on those cameras and very quiet yes also one other thing it has the tilt screen in the back it, it's basically it's not a one that you pop out like to the side it just tilts upward mm. and i like yeah. that because it's like you're looking directly into like a chimney viewfinder but it's not. Yes. It's just a screen that's pointing up at you. And when the subject is in front of you looking at you and you're looking down at the camera, they don't see the screen. No, they don't. And they don't and they wonder what you know, what is he doing? Is he taking a picture or yeah. not? Again, the camera is so quiet that when I release the shutter, they can't even, I can barely hear it at times. And I get some amazing photos that way. Yeah, there are, there, there are some options, I think, to, to turn the clicking sound off on, on a lot of them. I, I agree with you because the, 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 I don't want to bang on about the Luminex GX9 too often, but I will. It also has a tilting screen as well as a tilting viewfinder that you can push up. And, and, and you're right, I found that with the OM10 range as well. The lens I did like was the 17 millimeter, which again, it doubles once you stick it on there. And, and I, I, that's why I've got rid of the GX. Um, and so that's why I've got rid of the GR, the Ricoh GR 3X, because it's a 40 millimeter lens. I can't, it sounds really weird. I can't quite cope with anything that wide on the street because recently I took a photograph with a, and I actually sidled up to the person. I held the camera down at my kneecap and took the shot because I've got a 16 mil lens on, or a 16 millimeter lens on there that I can, I know is wide enough. I know pointing at them that it will get them in shot. And maybe I just need to crop in a bit. Same with the wide angle lenses i'm a big fan of them on the street but yeah i agree with you on the on the olympus om 10 range fantastic cameras but i unfortunately fell in love with fuji film <laughs> yeah no no i mean they're they're great cameras and in fact if i ever had to buy another camera i would certainly look at the fuji film lineup the xt the xt range which is very very i mean i bought an xt1 last year for like 200 i suppose maybe 300 dollars. i don't know what the exchange rate is uh it was the very first one it's like eight nine years old it had things on it that i'd not seen on cameras before it has dual screen it has um that kind of you, you know that horizon is level it has that kind of level horizon thing and i just fell in love with it i've got an xt2 this year uh, and i've got various people that i know in the camera group that i'm in they're going steve what's it like i said go buy one and they go buy one and they go i love it but those om10s uh, and em5s I, I do kind of miss them you know what does street photography mean to you i mean you mentioned that you were obsessed with it why is it such an obsession i think it's because 
uh, for somebody who's incredibly shy, and I am phenomenally shy and awkward in social situations, I want to record people. Uh, and I'm not trying to, I'm not prying into their lives, but I think we need to capture moments and we need to look at things. I give you an illustration of this because I thought about this a lot. There's a photograph, not taken by me, of two women, well, tell a lie, a, a woman and a girl outside uh, a cinema. It's in America, and it must be the mid-50s. It's, it's in colour, and they're wearing cotton dresses, the sun shining, the woman's black and the little girl's black. They're either mother and daughter or they're sisters. It's a wonderful photograph. The sun is shining. But as you look up in the photograph, there's a sign above them that says, white entrance only. And I looked at that photograph and I thought, yeah, because we've got to remember stuff like that. There's a lot of poverty around. There's a lot of people on the street. And I tried not to photograph them because I feel awkward about it. I find it very difficult, but I'm not doing myself justice as a street photographer. I'm not saying that I go around photographing depressing stuff. I do a lot of shadow and light. I do a lot of people just passing through. It, it, that's the thing that kind of attracts me. And it is quite a passionate thing. I get very upset with people that say, well, I don't get upset with them. I just kind of roll my eyes and I shouldn't really. That say, well, why are you taking photographs of people? What do you want to do that for, Steve? And I kind of look at them. Well, that's the reason for your attitude you to be honest with you because I think it's important to capture life and 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 we don't do it enough I mean I I see stuff that people walk past and I'm thinking why are you walking past it can't you see this you know and and they can't and and um that's where was I reading Joel who's the Joel is it Markovich I can't think of his name he's an American photographer and he kind of says we should be photographing these things we should not be allowing them just to drift past us I photograph quite a bit on the streets of Toronto because that's where I live. And in the streets of Toronto, you, you know, just like any other major mo- metropolitan city, you'll find good and bad and you find despair and you find tragedy. And, y- you know, you 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 will see a lot of people, as you said, just going about their day, ignoring them like it doesn't exist. I've documented that and I make no qualms about it. I have no issues doing it. Very much to your point, I think it's important. I think it needs to be documented. More importantly, I think the more correct statement, it needs to be told. It needs to be shown. People need to see this in their feeds. They need to be reminded in case they have forgotten what it's like out there in real life. Yeah. I believe a good photograph is impactful and nothing impacts and grabs your attention quite like tragedy or quite like the truth, let's say. Okay, because you know that saying the truth hurts. Well, that's part of what street photography is for me as well. It's the pain that you see in the truth on the streets. That's part of what I believe street photography is. So it's good to hear you say that. Oh, great. That, 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 that is good. I don't find many people that are. I would say to you that I'm a very traditional street photographer. I come from the 50s and 60s and 70s school of street photography. For me, street photography must be urban. You know, I'm not saying it's got to have a street in it, but it's got to be urban. And a lot of street photographers argue. Martin Parr is the famous street, photo- well, street photographer in the UK. And he does the beach as well. And I looked at his beach shots thinking, yeah, all right, fair enough. You've got me. You're actually, you're actually right. I, I, but I'm trying to think of the photographers. So, so we've already talked about Vivian uh, Saul Leiter is a huge influence. I'm just looking over a, a, a. I just bought this huge Saul Leiter book. It's fantastic. It's got all his work in it. There's a photographer called Ouija, I think. But I also got a little slightly obsessed with war photographers. There's one you've probably not heard of called Tim Page, did Vietnam War. There's Don McCullen. One photographer that I've been really fascinated with his work lately. Now, he's not a street photographer. Sebastian Delgado, just phenomenal work. You really should look him up. He's not a street photographer, but he would be a photographer that does document tragedy in life. So he has been known to travel the world to document, you know, world events, current affairs, things that are developing at that time. And he documents them and, and quite vividly, like just brilliant photographer. So you really should check him out. I mean, I agree with you because, like as a, as a photographer, I think it's very important to look at other influences and not. I don't just look at street photographers. I look at them all. Um, I, I look at fashion photographers as well. Oh, right. You know, okay. and I look at cinematographers as well because the way a, a film cameraman sets a scene can sometimes it, you, it's it's like a still. You, you know, I mean, Wes Anderson does it quite a lot. You look at that, you look at that image on the screen, and you go, "That's a photograph." It's just fact, fact that people are moving means it's a film, <laughs> and that has its influences. And I like film noir. You know, again, you're going back to the 40s and 50s. That kind of classic black and white, high tones, you know, high contrast rather, black and white stuff. I, I love. You know, Citizen Kane has a huge impact on me every time I watch it because for the photography, not not necessarily for the film, which is good, but the photography in that is 
just superb so so other photographers are, are just as important i wouldn't say to people just look at street photographers look at them all you mentioned before that you're a shy fellow how did you overcome the fear of photographing people on the streets you must have had fears and you must have found it difficult in the beginning and how did you overcome that and are you still trying to overcome that it's funny you should say that because yeah strangely enough I still have my moments now when I miss a photograph because I haven't quite got the capacity to, to press the button. I walk back sometimes now and take the damn photograph. But how did how did I overcome it? Doing street photography is what, is what helped me come out of my shell. I'm quite introverted, you know, quite insular. I, I, I live entirely inside my head a lot of the time, um, which is never good, good on the social level. So at times when I'm kind of bold and I go, oh, to hell with it, I'm going to go out and take some photographs and I don't really care if people look at me in a very strange way. Uh, one of the tactics, and this sounds really horrible it's not really a tactic of uh, I, I, I think i was i was down in camden in in, in north london uh, last year taking some street photographs and somebody looked at me and it gave me that kind of look of you taking my photograph and what i've learned is when you see somebody like that is to walk towards them don't turn around because then they'll know you've done it if you have the ability to walk towards them then by all means do but it's still on a daily basis for me i kind of i kind of sometimes struggle to 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 to, to, to press the shutter button it's not as much as it used to be and, and after a conversation like this, if this was like in the morning and I had the afternoon, I'd be out now. I'd be out in the afternoon because I had this conversation with you, I had this discussion, I'm fired up, I'm going to do some street photography. But sometimes it depends on mentally. What I would say is, and I do say this to a lot of people, is that street photography is often my therapy. It helps me get through the day, you know. I think photography in general is like that for a lot of people. It's a therapy or an escape or a way to maintain balance in one's life. It's a way of life for me. And I find that without photography, I'm really incomplete. Now, I do like street photography quite a bit for many of the points that we've just touched on. And I like street photography more so now than any other genre of photography because I just love the challenge of I know I've got to build up the courage and take that picture. And it's an accomplishment. And that's part of what I love about street photography, creating a Kodak moment. I'm sorry, I'm old. Hey, no, no, I'm just I'm just as old. I can tell you my age. No, but I'm no, not we going don't need to. to know that for you or for me. But what I'm saying <laughs> is that's the way I am. And I think that's true even now. Like, I mean, look, there have been people that got into photography just when COVID happened. And why? Because everybody was cooped up inside. They couldn't do anything. They were losing their minds. I've already spoken with a few people on my show that have said COVID was the reason why I got into street photography. And I can understand that because, you know, what else can you do? Well, I can get a camera and I can walk around, even if I have to wear a mask according to the law, but I can still walk around on the streets and take pictures. A lot of people got into photography that they way. They did indeed. And why? Because it comes back to that word, balance. Yeah, it does. Do do you, do, you, do, you, sorry, do you know what I did? Because I had to work from home. I, I, this is what I did. And I had one window pointing out. Of, we had a home office. which We had a home office long before COVID arrived. We worked from home a bit. And I got a tripod. I stuck my camera on it. I pointed it out the window. And there's a high elevated pathway from the view of the window. I stuck my camera on there, tripod. And I had a cable. And if I wasn't, because I do IT support. If I wasn't busy doing IT support, I'd look up. If somebody's walking past, I'd take a photograph. And that and I did that for a good, like, seven or eight months. I, I mean, the good thing was we had a dog. So we, 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 we were allowed to go out on one journey with a dog. But when we walk for miles and I take my camera with me, which also introduced me to other photography, like landscape. I do like landscape photography. And I'm also now getting into studio portrait lit photography as well, because I think it's important. So street photography is my comfort zone. But one of my favorite quotes from Dwayne Johnson is that comfort zones are great, but nothing ever grows there. And I love that. I, I tell myself that almost every day. So that is why I branch out. That is why I've got some studio lights that I want to set up. That's why I go and do some landscape photography. I, I, I need to broaden my horizons. But you're right about it being therapy. It is very much so like when you said it's part of your life, it's part of mine, and I called it an obsession, but what it really is, is just part of my actual life. Have you ever photographed on the streets with someone else or in a group? And if so, being a shy person, as you've mentioned, do you like that or do you prefer to be solo? It's funny you should say that because as a great street photographer, although he's an all-round photographer, an English guy called Sean Tucker, and he's amazing because he he talks about how he feels about photography, not just the photography. And his stuff on YouTube is inspiring. And it was uh, and and I had the chance to meet him in the group 
it was like they don't they always say never meet your hero because you'll be disappointed i met him i got him to sign his book how fanboy is that and, and let me guess you weren't disappointed no i wasn't disappointed at all <laughs> not in the, not in the slightest he was just he was just fabulous he was just brilliant he was very relaxed he was just exactly the same way he is on youtube and there was a group of us there must have been about 30 uh, uh, and we all wandered off with him around sheffield now i did break off in that group a bit but i stuck with somebody which is quite unusual but i thought i need to, not to be so solitary all the time and the funny thing about being in a group following another photographer around is that people in sheffield will come up to us and say what's happening what's going on? they thought we were paparazzi because we've all got cameras on <laughs> but you know i don't look like well i might like paparazzi I, I, I don't know i don't look scummy enough sorry i shouldn't have said that i apologize to all paparazzi everywhere let's hope there's none listening let's hope there's none listening they're not they're not all that word i just used that i won't use again um some of them are really nice but that, that was a group but what i do lately and particularly because i've now joined a camera group and i did this saturday i did the saturday before no the sunday before as i find somebody to go out with they're not necessarily into street photography but as i remarked recently i've got more friends who are street photographers than i actually have friends <laughs> so we all end up going out uh, sometimes in one sometimes sometimes in threes and fours and I can do it. And, and I suppose I, I, I probably protest too much that I'm shy because most people would say that I'm, I'm not. But I still have that bit in me that, that, that I hold back every so often. But I do. I've not gotten out of a group the size of Sean Tucker's group, but I would love to again. But I do go out in ones and twos. Well, obviously ones and twos. I do, I do go out in, in twos and occasionally threes and fours. I'll go out because, yeah, it's fun to be in a group for the fact that the camaraderie is there and then afterwards you go for a bite to eat and a drink. My only issue with being in a group walk is you see a group of photographers and the people that you potentially could have been shooting will come up to you and say, hey, what's going on? What's going on? Or there's distraction, yeah. right? Yeah. The other issue, sometimes I feel that it takes away from my focus because I have to pay attention to the person talking to me or what's going on with the group. And therefore, I'm not in my zone 100%. So that's another issue. But I balance it out because if I feel like that day, I just want a nonchalant sort of stroll in the streets of Toronto, then I don't really care so much. But if I find that I wake up that day and I want to go shooting on the streets and I, I say to myself, I don't want to be disturbed. I just want to photograph and concentrate on my composition, the storytelling, then I will not go with anybody and I will not go to groups, right? I tend to lean towards the solo rather than the group. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of get what you're saying. Um, I, I used to work on the outskirts of Sheffield and I went for a job interview and I got the job. It was in the middle of Sheffield. And the first thing I thought about the job in the middle of Sheffield was, damn, I'm in the middle of the city. What street photography can I do here? Literally, the job was, and I still do, I still got the same job. But for me, and I'll come back to the point, what I'm trying to say here is that I actually went for a job and I actually looked where I was being interviewed and thought this place is amazing. Centre of Sheffield is, is beautiful. It's under a huge amount of development it's culturally multicultured. but then I've realized I didn't have a lot of time to do street photography and I thought well what am I doing and I heard lots of people say well I've got, got a lot of time for street photography in general Steve and I sat there thinking when's the best time I'm at work to go and do street photography my lunch break I have an hour and that's how I've got so much because now I've, st I've tried to stop myself because it's Christmas and I've got other things that I need to do like wrap up Christmas presents send them off etc you know all the practical stuff but I, 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 I go out at my lunch time my lunch break and I can wander because Sheffield's not very not very big I can wander from one well no I can't I can only go to one side of it in lunch break but I maybe go three miles which is like 45 minutes it's probably slightly too long maybe two miles out 30 minutes and two miles back and I've, you know, and that's when I do a lot of street photography and I do it on my own. And because the job I do is not high pressured, it's it's IT support. It's not high pressured, but I find it relaxes me. And like you, I find myself better when I'm with somebody who's not a street photographer. As I'm out on lunch breaks, when I'm in the London office, sometimes they come out walking with me and they suddenly discover how rude I am because I'll tell them to stop. I'll tell them to shut up. I'll tell them to get out of my shot. I'll tell them not to move. And I don't mean to be rude. And I do warn them. This is what it's going to be like but you're a street photographer it's in your blood exactly exactly <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is very much because I can't stand people that ruin my shots, you know. Uh, uh, you know, and that sounds, sounds quite childish to a degree because I'm so focused and so, like you are so focused. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of a funny word to use the word focused when we're focusing with a camera. But, you know, we're so focused no on... None intended. None, none whatsoever. We're so focused that I really, 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 really... And I hate to say it, it sounds really awful. You step into my shot and I, I you know, friendships could end. <laughs> Oh my goodness. You know. Yeah, so I'll have to make a point to never go on a photo walk with you. You can, you can just you... <laughs> Because I would do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but funny enough, some photos, some photographs where people have kind of photo bombed them, I actually can't quite work out quite well, actually. But um, you're right. I, I, I would have to tell you to stop. <laughs> I probably would return the same sort of attitude. I don't know if you like Grand Prix driving. I don't know if you know anything about it, but there was a driver called Senna and Ayrton Senna said nothing else mattered. He was so focused on driving that everything else was obliterated. My father is a big F1 fan. So growing up, I literally had to watch F1 racing all the time with him. Good. Good. Damn straight as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I, and I joke to people because I can't watch motorbike racing because they just go round and round and round. I don't see the point. Um, as, as people, but the 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 other quote is from uh, so, so Senna was always very focused. But there's a film quote, Steve McQueen, and again, it's about driving. He says everything before about driving, everything before and after is just waiting. And I'm like that with street photography. Everything before and after is just waiting for me to go out and do more street photography, and that is quite a, an, an obsession. But um, I, I, you know, I, I I enjoy it. I get a I get a buzz out. I don't get a buzz out of trying to take people in an unflattering poses. But I did. Took, I took a photograph of a guy yawning on an underground London Underground uh, train, and he's yawning. His mouth's quite wide. And I looked at it, and I took me it took me about two weeks to decide to post it. And when I posted it, people said, "Love it." The other thing I think we do as photographers is we overthink and we overcriticize ourselves. And I'm always telling people that. You know, there are times that people will react in one way or another, and a lot of times. The ones that react the most positive I have found are the ones that are always, can I see the picture? And would you mind emailing that to me? And I'm like, yeah, no, absolutely. Why not? That's motivation for me. When someone comes up to me and says, can I see your image that you just took of me? And I show them and they're very impressed. I'm speechless in a way. Yeah. I mean, that, like I say, you need to come to the UK because I don't know if you know, there's uh, a seaside town in the north, just above or across from where Sheffield is called Whitby. It's famous, I think, because that's where Dracula lands in in the book. But it has a goth and steampunk kind of festival where loads of people dress up as goths and steampunks. And it is phenomenal. And what happened, because I went, they have it in October and I think April. I could be wrong about those months. But what you find is, A, it's wall to wall. I mean, I'm not kidding you. It's not like there's one or two or three steampunks or goths. There are hundreds in one street. And what you found was, is that they would say, oh, can you take my photograph? Or did you take my photo? And you get that coming back. They would say, look, here's my details. Can you send it to me? It, I don't necessarily like comic conventions because I think the costumes, mm. but, you know, but steampunks and goths, because it's like black and, uh, you know, that kind of stuff appeals to me. And, and they're all out on the streets or in the hotels or they're in the cafes. And it's really funny when you find the cafes because they've probably taken their helmet off or something. And they're just sitting there trying to eat, doing normal stuff. You take a photo. They are very, very, yeah, they reciprocate. They kind of say, yeah, please, can I see that photograph you took? Here's my, here's my email address. There's quite a few festivals that happen here in Toronto during the summer months. When I go to those, I get much the same sort of reaction where people will say, oh, can you take a photograph of me? Can you take a photograph of me? And a lot of the events are, in Toronto anyways, they have a lot of cultural events. Toronto is very much like a melting pot. There's many cultures here. And all those cultures have very unique, you know, attributes, of course, because, you know, they're cultures. There's festivities for Italian culture. There's festivities for Greek culture, Chinese culture, uh, Latino culture. And I really like photographing those ones because it's culture. And I love photographing diversity and culture and people in their ethnic dwelling, if you will. I really enjoy that sort of photography. Something like you just mentioned where town of Whitby, I believe you said, with all this steampunk and goth, I would be really cool. I think I would really enjoy something like that. I mean, I've got a friend who lives in Canada. Uh, is it Victoria Island? I can never remember whereabouts, he says. Um, yeah, that's the West Coast. Yeah, the West Coast. He lives over there six months, and then he comes back to the UK for six months. Very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not envious in any way, shape, or form. Because, cause, you know, I've, I've, I've been to New York for the second time. And he says, uh, he says they have loads of stuff going on all the time. And you, you don't necessarily see that in, in Sheffield. I and mean, we've got a Christmas market, but it's a bit of a, I hate to use the phrase, tourist trap or just a people trap, really. And there's a Ferris wheel and stuff like that. And it's all a bit, uh, you know, it loses something. Although I'm forever going down there taking photographs, so I shouldn't really complain. One of the places that I would really love to go is down south, places like, you know, Mexico or Peru or somewhere like that. I'm really drawn to that sort of culture, and I really would love to have the opportunity to document it. So I'm looking at your feet, and your black and white images are really nicely processed. I love the way you edit them. And I'm just wondering, your Instagram is predominantly black and white, so I'm going to assume that, you know, you're mostly a black and white sort of guy. 
How does black and white differ from color for you? Because it seems as if to me, you put more emphasis on black and white. And do you find them to be totally separate beasts? Is that why you shoot more black and white to color? Like, what's your what's your train of thought behind that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, because I do try and post color. At least once every sort of eight months, I find a color shot that I like. Color is a distraction. Uh, I'm, I'm possibly paraphrasing what I've heard, but it works for me, I think, because color's a distraction. We've got color all around us all of the time. And just to go on a slight diversion, I was on a, uh, one of the camera group meetings last week, and I have a judge on there that does a big competition in Yorkshire. That's the kind of county that I live in and Sheffield's in. And every so often she'd say, oh, look, because uh, she was she was critiquing photographs that the group had done and every so often she would say oh look somebody's had the courage to post a black and white photograph we don't see enough black and white i feel i grew up in a household where the tv was black and white i watched black and white movies some of my favorite movies are things like manhattan we didn't have a color tv for 1976 you know and even then it was it's a bit bright isn't it what i like about black and whites i think it just it just pairs everything back you've got some tonal range you've got you know, I don't necessarily always like greys. And I'll tell you what I do, and I meant to tell you this. Um, every camera I get, I set the metering to spot metering right away, and I never come off it. Because I know when I take a shot, particularly if it's the shadow, I've done one recently, I know that if I expose for the middle, the, the outside will be black, and then there'll be the light coming in. I think black and white is, is better than colour at getting across, I don't know, a feeling a motivation color color annoys me sometimes but having said that you know Saul Leiter's color work I, I love to death uh, I'm not I'm not adverse to color I just find black and white better and the standing joke at the camera group it, for me is every time I look at a photograph I stand up and go I think I look better in black and white and they're so used to me saying it now they just laugh I was posting a photograph recently of two women in a restaurant both adjusting their hair and it had been in color for a long time and I was going to post it in color but when I came to post it I just thought I wonder what that looks like in black and white and then it became black and white. That's really a common argument, right? Where people say color is a distraction. That's very yeah. common. That's a common thing that street photographers in particular will argue. Now, having said that, not a lot of people, I think, talk about this or it's not mentioned or it's not known. I have no idea. But as a black and white predominantly focused photographer, which I am as well, there are many iterations of black and white that you can achieve when you're post-processing your work. I certainly went through that. I started with just a regular look out of the camera. But soon after, I, I found very quickly that I didn't like that. So what did I do? I did what everybody else would do. I started working on my editing. And I can see that in your work as well, that you've certainly developed a particular workflow that you've achieved. And I'm assuming that you like. Maybe it's still evolving. I don't know. A lot of my work to this day is a lot of high key sort of thing. Uh, very similar to, you know, JC Pan film. It's very much that high key structure look, kind of like old surveillance film. That's kind of where my style is at. And I like that style. And I think for me, that's how I want to present the image. There's so many things you can do with just black and yes. white. There's there's not just black and white. There's tones there in is. black and white. And there is. <laughs> you can do so much with it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, recently I was posting some photographs I took down at Manvers Lake. I, I hadn't seen them for a year. I just came across them, all taken on the Ricoh GR2, the camera that I cried over. And I looked at them and I thought, I, I just thought, I can't believe, and I, I did very little editing, a bit cropping, I, I do crop, uh, but but I did very little retouching, very little slider moving in Lightroom. I will always use Lightroom, and I really don't go anywhere near Photoshop. But the t there's one of a woman with a with her back to us, and she's got a dog on a lead in the water, and her hair is amazing, but her skin, it's not black, it's not white, it's just this tone. And I remember, and there's lots of there's lots in that series. And I'm thinking, this is why I like black and white. I mean, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. There's more than just black and white. That is a very, very good point. Yeah. I think that's something that, as I said, I don't know if it's talked about, if it's known. I have no idea. They seem to forget that black and white is not just black and white. Yeah. There is a plethora of tones within those two dynamics. And you can achieve so much and you can present your image in various ways. And, and sometimes I think people don't, like I said, I don't know if they realize it or, or it doesn't get talked about or maybe it does and I'm missing the boat here. I don't know. But that's what I think is so fascinating about black and white to me. So there's an image on your Instagram feed and you posted it not too long ago, November the 10th. 
it's an image where you're in a room or an apartment or what have you. You're definitely in a, a building. There's what seems to be a lady to the right and the shadow of a man, I believe, to the left. She's taking a photograph of the skyline. Can you talk about that picture? Because when I look at that picture, I think to myself, wow, what's going on here? Where was he? Who are these people? What's so beautiful that they're photographing? Like, And, and I love the way you crunch the darks on this image. Like, It's so mysterious because you've made it very dark. Do you know which image I'm talking about? I'm looking at it right now. So yeah, so this is taken up out of the window of the Empire State Building. Um, it's it's on the beautiful Panasonic uh, TZ100. You know, it's not the it's not the Rico. It's not the cult street camera that people bang on about relentlessly. Um, I was with a friend because I was, I was going to see a friend, uh, and he commented afterwards. He said, "You saw that photograph before you took it," and I went, "Well, yeah." <laughs> and and I hate to say it like that because it's automatic in me now you know and it does become automatic in photographers I think as well I was attracted by the light I was attracted by I have triggers they talk people always talk about triggers I've, I've noticed this on YouTube uh, street photo. I do have triggers one is the light one is people wearing hats and one is people doing stuff and I wanted them to be more interesting than the view because that's a classic although you can't see it that's a classic New York skyline you know out there but I wanted a photograph of people taking it because the skyline always gets all the kudos. But there's people as well. And also, of course, it's the light uh, in the photograph as well that I'm also attracted to. It's the shading. And yeah, I did I did want it to be as black. He blends into the rest of the wall almost. He's almost not there. And I couldn't help myself. And people would say, well, why did you do that? And I just, because I wanted to, because I like it that way. It's my picture, damn it. Yeah, it's my picture. Go away, <laughs> leave me alone. Because um, I, I do get comments that my photographs are too dark. And I do find myself lighting them up sometimes. But with this one, I went, no, I like the way the light's coming through the window. She's holding, she's taking a photograph. And I like taking photographs of people taking photographs. I'm, I'm sad that way. But that whole kind of light coming through was what attracted me. There's, there's quite a few other shots as well that I, I took. You know, I, I just was immediately attracted to that photograph. What would you like viewers to take away from your work? I, I had somebody come up to me in the group. Um, it's a photograph that's just been published in Amateur, the Mag uh, Amateur Photographer magazine uh, in the UK. And he came up to me and said, you took that shot. That's a beautiful shot. I suppose his reaction, I like, a, I like a positive reaction. I like a good reaction. I'm not looking for approval. You don't have to like my stuff. When Steven Spielberg first started in, in making films, he said he always made the films he wanted to see and he didn't really care about anybody else. And to a degree, I want to take the photographs I want to take. And if you like them, you like them. If you don't, you don't. I was in the office recently last week and uh, I looked out the window and there was this beam of this, this patch of light coming into this shadow between buildings and somebody's walking through it. I ran back to my desk. It's not that far. And I hoid my camera. I'd taken the camera into work this time. Again, it's the Panasonic, the one that set, the one that took this shot, set the spot metering. And I leaned out of the, well, I leaned up against the window to get some of the, get rid of the reflection and shadow and started to shoot. I want people to be attracted to the light. And I suppose it's because I'm attracted to the light as well. So, Steve, where can people go to look at your work? Where can they go in the virtual world to see your work and reach out to you if they have any questions? I think the best place is going to be Instagram. And there, of course, I'm, I'm just shooker69. <laughs> and I will have that in the show notes below for our listeners as well. Steve, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a guest here on the Street Photography Show podcast. It's been a pleasure. I, I think it's been really good. You're a great host. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I was really nervous to start with. I've really enjoyed it. You're really good. Thank you. I I've, I've subscribed. It. I'm going to make sure. I'm not just going to listen to mine. As a matter of fact, I won't listen to mine because I can't stand the sound of my own voice. <laughs> I will listen to the other one, though. I have really, really enjoyed this. I'm so happy to hear that. Well, listen, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a blast. Great conversation between you and I loved hearing a little bit more about yourself and your work and as i said listeners go check out his work the information is in the show notes below it's really truly phenomenal work if you enjoyed the show please remember to follow and highly rate the show as it allows me to continue creating more content for you my awesome listeners also don't forget to join us next week as new episodes are added on fridays until next time keep walking and keep clicking this is mark rossi bye for now